thank you so much, Fergus. Good evening, everyone. It's really good to be back with you again. Uh, it's always a joy to have fellowship with Fergus and all the team and you all. So thank you for joining with us. Um, Fergus mentioned the book. You must have took it back with you. That's all right. You have to pay for that one first. There's no freebies tonight. You have one, don't you? I do. Yeah. Um, they're at the back, but I want to actually talk to you a, a little bit about um, some of the contents of the book. It's, it's called Breaking Through Barriers to Blessing, and it suddenly dawned on me today um, as I was contemplating what to bring to you that I've been a few times now to minister to you, and I've never actually talked about this, and I felt it was um, important that I did that tonight. So basically it talks about the obstacles that there are in our lives that prevent us experiencing what the Bible calls the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I haven't even been appealing or coming to the front already, isn't it? Amazing? <laughs> it's always better not looking at the back of a pillar, isn't it? Um, there are things that get in the way. And, and if you have read the Bible or read Christian biographies of people who have been used by God in mighty ways, you might stroke your chin and think, that's not the way my life is. Um, and you know, there are no special people, except that we're all special <laughs> in God's eyes. But there are no superheroes. There are no ready-made saints. Everybody that we read of in the Bible was an ordinary person, just like you and me. Even Elijah, the Bible says, was subject to like passions and desires as we are. And so we've got to demystify the characters in Scripture to realize these were flesh and blood sinners like the rest of us that have the same struggles and the same worries and the same problems. But what was it that enabled them to overcome and to blaze a trail for for God or Christ. Obviously, it was this full life, this life of blessing, where they were possessed completely by God, filled with the Spirit, baptized with the Spirit, etc., all these terms that we can use. But some of us have got stuck somewhere along the way and don't enter into that fullness of the blessing. And there, there are reasons for that. But I want to read Scripture, first of all, with you. First Thessalonians 5, um, we'll read a couple of verses there at the end of chapter 5 if you want to read along with me. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. And Paul says, May God himself, the God of peace, or the God of shalom, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I want to read that to you from the message, which is... More of a paraphrase, but I love the way it paraphrases those verses. Listen. May God himself, the God who makes everything holy, H-O-L-Y, and whole, W-H-O-L-E. So the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. And I love that. But here's the thing that we often miss. Some of us want to be holy, H-O-L-Y, but we're not whole. And so there's a whole section of the church, and it's all about rules and regulations, and we might call that legalism or just religiosity. But they're broken inside, and they're limping on their way to heaven, not whole, and, and they're not actually achieving holiness because they're broken. And I'm not talking about physical brokenness here, I'm talking about more emotional, mental, spiritual brokenness. But then there are those who want to be whole, but they don't want to be holy. You know, and they come to the front for healing nights like this, and, and we want to encourage you to do that, of course. But they're not prepared to be holy. In other words, they're not prepared to let go of their sin and they want God to fix them. But they're not prepared to turn from their sins, their wicked ways, as Scripture says. And you see, if you want to be holy, you've got to be whole. You need healing. There's healing in the gospel. Mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical healing. 
But if you want to be holy, you need to be holy. But if you want to be whole, you need to be holy. And so I have broken in this book, kind of distilled the, the areas of barriers to blessing down to three general areas. All right? Sins, wounds, and demons. And the remedy for each of those problems is different. So it's very important that you diagnose the condition so that you can apply the correct cure. And what, what I mean by that is, in evangelical circles, very often we just hammer about sin and tell people to repent and turn from their, their sins and believe the gospel. And that's true, thank God. Uh, it's a wonderful message of forgiveness. But as a lot of people repent and repent and repent and repent and repent, they keep falling off the wagon because there's deep woundedness and brokenness in their heart and this sin has become a coping mechanism for a, a wound that needs healing. So that's why healing is intrinsic to the gospel. People need their hearts healed and their heads healed. But then there, there are those, as I said, who just want the healing but they're not prepared to repent and come into line with God's truth. And then there are those who ignore the fact that it's not just about sin and it's not just about woundedness but actually there is a devil and he is real and he's got a whole uh, universal network of demonic forces and they want to make our lives living hells and what they do is they empower our ungodly behaviors so that if you've got sin that is a coping mechanism for a wound you will find that wound and sin becomes a breeding ground for the demonic to inhabit just like germs can get into a wound. Remember when you were wee and you fell off your bike um, and your mommy, when you ran in squealing, she put probably dead oil and cotton wool and, and you're thinking, oh, you're making it worse, you're making it worse. What are you doing that for? But she's trying to kill the germs because if she doesn't kill the germs, there'll be infection. And the demonic is what brings infection into our lives and a drivenness to poison our lives. That's why a lot of people can't get off this cycle of sin because of their wounds. And we know pain seeks out pleasure. Alcoholics Anonymous will tell you that. Any uh, recovery program will tell you pain seeks out pleasure. But what they'll not tell you probably is that the demonic will drive you on in that behavior. So let's talk about each of those for a few moments tonight. Is that okay? Yeah. If it's not too bad, you're going to hear it anyway. <laughs> Sins need to be repented of. It's a different remedy. Sins need to be repented of. Wounds need to be healed. Demons need to be expelled. You can't expel a sin. And you can't heal a sin. And you can't repent of a wound or repent of a demon. Sins need to be repented of. Wounds must be healed and demons expelled. The first word of the gospel from John the Baptist was repent. The next word of the gospel from Jesus was repent. It was the first word of both their sermons. And when you go to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, there's seven letters written to seven churches in Asia Minor, and five out of those seven churches that Jesus spoke through John to, the command was repent, 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 repent. So repentance is big in the Bible, and it's big in the gospel, but unfortunately it's not too big in the church these days. Repentance simply means a change of mind, metanoia, the Greek word where you change your way of thinking, that affects actually a change of heart and a change of life. There's a guy in Acts chapter 8, and I want, maybe you'd like to turn to this if you have your Bible, Acts chapter 8, and his name was Simon Magus, and he was a sorcerer, he was a magician, and he dabbled in all sorts of wicked stuff. And it says he believed, and we're not quite sure whether he was the real thing or not. Then he was baptized... And I, over the years, preached both. <laughs> that he was a true believer and that he wasn't a true believer. It doesn't really matter in a sense, as we'll see in a moment or two, um, because of what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us here in Acts chapter 8. But what happens is, there's a, a, a kind of revival takes place in Samaria. And the apostles are sent down to these new Samaritan believers to lay hands on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And in verse 14 it says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, they were simply baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given 
by the laying on of hands of the apostles, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So he just saw this as a supernatural thing that was bigger and better than what he had dabbled in in witchcraft. And he wanted it. And Peter answered me, Your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. And J.B. Phillips translates that, To hell with you and your money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Something was wrong with his heart. And this is what Peter calls him to do. Simon, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord and hope that he may forgive you having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you're full of bitterness and captive to sin. Now, did this guy have demonic problems? Probably. He, he was a, a warlock. He had dabbled in witchcraft. People saw him as a mighty power, a supernatural power. So did he need deliverance? Probably. But the first thing that Peter calls him to do is repent. You know? And he discerned that actually, look at what he says, that you're full of bitterness. There was unforgiveness in his heart somewhere. There was resentment and envy. And also captive to sin. The old version says, in bondage. To iniquity and iniquity is sin that's passed down and being in bondage talks about demonic bondage so he had problems <laughs> but Peter calls him to repent now what is Simon's response verse 24 Simon answered pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me you know what he was praying fix me but he was, praying, he was saying to Peter fix me like some people come down an aisle, ask for prayer, fix me. But what about if we were to say to you, repent? What about the things in your life that are out of order? And maybe you're wondering why you haven't had the breakthrough, or you haven't had the healing, or you haven't had the freedom that you've been looking for for years, and you've been prayed over and prayed over. And not every, I'm not saying everybody that gets prayed for gets what they're looking for. They don't. But what I am saying is a lot of people don't get what they're asking God for because there's obstacles in the way and one of the biggest ones is sin that they're not prepared to repent of. A lot of people want fix me prayers but they're not prepared to come into line with the plumb line of God's truth. And maybe you need to repent tonight of something. It could be years ago. But the second obstacle is woundedness. Hurts. And that can come from all sorts of sources. Um, I mean, I would keep you here all night, but generally speaking, the highs and the lows of our human experience revolve around relationships. Isn't that right? So the best times and the worst times usually involve people. <laughs> and the first people that are in our lives that impact us the most are our parents. There will be no one else that will influence you as much as your parents. And whether they were there for you or not there for you, or whether they were present but emotionally absent, all of us, from the very moment of even our conception, are affected by the circumstances which we are conceived in and born uh, into in the world. And especially those first three, four, five years of our lives, we're just like little pieces of putty. We are molded by the influence of mum and dad. So what was that like for you? Thank God we honor father and mother, um, even if all we can honor them for is giving us life. So we're not bad-mouthing our parents, but at the same time, we're not meant to stick our head in the sand and be ignorant of the way things really were and how it has affected us in our lives. So maybe you have wounds because of things that your mom or your dad did or things that they said very often over our lives that have got a hold on us. Then there are relationships, not just sexual ones, but especially those, but there are also friendships that are disordered, controlling, negative. There can be authority figures in our lives. They can be bosses, teachers, um, ministers, priests, pastors, that negatively affect our lives. And so we need to look at these relationships and ask ourselves the question, have ties to these people in some way affected me through wounding? And then a huge area of wounding often comes from trauma. 
And what I mean by that is something that has happened in the past, it might revolve around an individual, but it could be a circumstance, an accident, or an event. And whilst we ourselves may or may not have recovered physically from that occurrence, internally, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, we can still be broken. We actually effectively can be tied to that event. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, um, I think some of you will have heard of him. I'll just check the time. Um, he was Westminster Chapel, a wonderful expositor of the Word of God. He, he was a Harley Street specialist, a physician, before he went into ministry. And before he went to London, uh, to Westminster, he was actually a minister in the Welsh Valleys. And on a Sunday afternoon, uh, one week in 1930, um, two uh, Christian men in the district came to see him, very concerned about a schoolmaster in the area, who they said had some kind of depressive condition that was actually affecting giving him headaches, nausea, pains all over his body. He just was not well, and he, he, couldn't, he couldn't work anymore. And it was a great loss to the community and to the church. And they said, do you think you could come and visit him? So he called in with this gentleman, and he began to ask him a few questions. He said, as soon as he saw me, he said, you look depressed. He says, I am. He says, but I've more than that. I have these headaches, I have nausea. I'm just not well at all, and I have no motivation to, to go out. And he asked the man, Lloyd-Jones asked him, when did this start? And he says, well, I can, I can tell you, in 1915, 1914, the war broke out. 1915, he was assigned to the Navy as a young man, and he was in the Gallipoli campaign, and he was in a submarine, and the submarine hit a mine, and the, the, the submarine plummeted to the bottom of the ocean. And Lloyd-Jones said to him, well, tell me the rest of the story. And he said, well, that's it. There is nothing more to the story. And he, Lloyd Jones made him go through the story all over again about the hitting the mine and the submarine hitting the bottom of the ocean. And then Lloyd Jones would say, and, and, and tell me more. What, what else is there? He says, There is nothing else. And he was starting to get exasperated uh, at the minister. And, uh, and then Lloyd Jones asked him this very incisive question Do you mean to tell me that you are still at the bottom of the Mediterranean Ocean? And that man was. Mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, he was stuck in an event 15 years prior. And this was now 1930, and Lloyd-Jones prayed a very simple prayer with that man, and he got free, and he got healed in that moment. But if you've got demonic problems at all, you need to repent and you need to deal with the entry points of those things. And I want to close by looking at Acts chapter 19 for a moment. Acts chapter 19. We okay for time? Yes? Now this is in, in Ephesus. Um, and in verse 11, I love this. It says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul or by the hands of Paul. I'd settle for a few ordinary miracles, wouldn't you? What's an extraordinary miracle? What must that have been? God did extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul. Um, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. That's marvellous, isn't it? Then down to verse 17. Well, we'll, not, we'll, we'll read on if that's okay. Where were we? Verse 13. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of, the, of, of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief, chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. That would be humorous if it wasn't so serious. These wannabe exorcists saw what Paul did in the name of Jesus, and they thought, we'll have a go at this. And the demon spoke back and said, uh, we know Paul, we know Jesus, who are you? Does the, does the devil know you? Do the demons know you for the right reasons? They didn't know them. And then the guy who had the demon gave 
these uh, so-called exorcists are kicking. Now, what happened was fear come upon some people because of this. If you look on um, verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Look at verse 18. Now, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. Hold on a minute. So these unbelievers got a kicking from the demons. And the believers who had already trusted Christ got terrified when they saw what had happened. Why? Because they had one foot in the kingdom of darkness and one foot in the kingdom of God. In other words, they were born again, converted, but they were holding on to some of their old ways, some of their old superstitions, some of their old amulets, their magic books, their tarot cards or whatever it was in Ephesus, Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians or whatever it was, they were holding on to it and they realized you can't do that. Because if you give the devil a foothold, it will become a stronghold and then it will become a stranglehold. And listen, I'm talking to Christians here tonight. There is no such a thing as inconsequential sin. And sometimes a little talk with Jesus doesn't make it right. Sometimes we get entangled in such a way as it's complicated. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to get us into knots so as it's complicated. You might say, well, and this is a huge subject, you know, Christians can't have demonic spirits. Well, there's a chapter in my book about that, chapter 13, Christian immunity. But can Christians sin? Can, do Christians have temptation through the flesh? Can the devil dangle a, a carrot in front of your nose and tempt you? So sin, the flesh, the, de- the, 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 the world's temptation can all affect you, but somehow you're immune to the demonic. Does that figure? It doesn't even make sense. Not least because the whole of the Bible in the New Testament, the whole of the New Testament, all the warnings, all the exhortations, beware of the devil, resist him. He's like a lion going about... We wrestle not with flesh and blood, put on the armor of God, etc., etc. It's all written to Christians. And if the devil was not a threat to the Christian, why would God the Holy Spirit be warning us so much? So what do you need to do if the devil has got any hold in your life? Well, it's found here. After verse 18, it says, A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they had calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachma, In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, one drachma was said to be a day's wage. One drachma. So 50,000 drachma. Now, if you think of, say, a day's wage today is 95 pounds for the sake of argument. You multiply that by 50,000. Do you know what it comes to? 4,750,000 pounds. That's the equivalent of the big bonfire that they had. And I tell you, we would need to have a bonfire here in Ireland. Both sides. So whether it's August or July, it doesn't matter. It would all need to go up in smoke. All our false allegiances, all our idolatries, all our demonic affiliations, whether it's in the church or outside the church, repentance needs to happen for our wicked ways, but we need to break the covenants and the agreements that we have with the enemy in our lives or even those that other people have made on our behalf in the past. Sins need to be repented of, wounds need to be healed, and demons cast out. And those three things can happen tonight for you. Let's pray. I want us to take a few moments, if that's okay. And the team will be available to pray for you afterwards, as normal. But whoever that is that that word was for in the flower of youth... One of the keys to healing and freedom, deliverance, is the key of forgiveness. And forgiveness does not mean forgetting. That's nonsense. Forgiveness does not mean letting a person scot-free off the hook. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. You don't have to be a friend with this person ever. Forgiveness just means you getting out of the road and letting God deal with it. Forgiveness means you being set free so that you are not afflicted 
and that person isn't in your head for the rest of your life. Forgiveness means that you can be set free and healed from what they did to you in the past. And it's a declaration of your will that's not an emotion. Hopefully the emotions will come where healing will affect the heart. But that's not what we're looking for. All you need is an act of the will where you say, Jesus, I choose to forgive so-and-so for what they did to me and how it made me feel. And I release them to you. That's all you need to do. I've seen people get healed by just doing that. I've seen demons leave people dramatically by just an act of forgiveness. Will you forgive that person tonight in the flower of your youth who maybe took your youth? Or maybe you're the person that wants set free and wants healed but you're not prepared to repent. Will you repent tonight? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or whatever the wounds are that need healed, maybe it's not directly related to someone else who has hurt you, but maybe they're self-inflicted wounds, I don't know. But he is the healer. Jesus is our great physician. Our Father God is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. And he is here to heal, forgive, and deliver tonight. Father, I just pray that you will lead in repentance. Holy Spirit, you are the one who came to convince of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. Holy Spirit, would you lead people in that way of forgiveness? Some of you need to forgive yourself. You need to release yourself into the forgiveness of God. Stop holding yourself in judgment when God has set you free. That's a terrible thing. Because what you're doing is you're setting yourself on a higher judicial seat than God. If he's ready to forgive you, who do you think you are? Get over yourself and forgive yourself and release yourself into God's forgiveness and receive the forgiveness of God. And I proclaim to you tonight the forgiveness and the remission of sins by the blood of Jesus when you repent and believe. You are forgiven. If you need healing tonight, whatever it is, maybe you're caught in a memory. Can I invite you right now not to re-traumatize yourself, okay? I'm not asking you to go into an abusive situation in your mind. But I'm talking to people who have flashbacks, recurring trauma in dreams and even during the day. I invite you to go to, say, the aftermath of, of the memory. Not the actual event, but the aftermath of the memory. Go to that in your mind, if you can, without re-traumatizing yourself. And I know it's not easy. But go right into that moment, and I want you to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, take my hand and come with me into this memory and heal this memory and release me from the power of this memory. Now, close your eyes, and in your mind's eye, watch in that, in that scene, in that memory, look for Jesus. Watch for him. Or listen for him. See what he does. Thank you, Jesus. What you see him do or what you hear him say, if you're not seeing or hearing anything, that's okay. There's a little bit more work to be done with your memory. That's okay. It's not a failure. But if you've seen or heard Jesus in that memory, that is now the healing of that memory. That's the conclusion of that memory. That is him releasing. That's what you ought to remember from now on in that memory. That Jesus was there and that Jesus is there and that he is healing and setting you free. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just ask now that you will release people from time traps and chains to the past. People who have suffered PTSD, I ask that you would bring healing to their spirit and soul and even their body in Jesus' name. 
And if you are struggling with the demonic, you need to repent of your sin. You need to ask the Lord to heal you of anything that it is using as an anchor hold in your life. But you need to rebuke the devil. Scripture says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. And it's up to you to say, enemy, go in Jesus' name. So is it lust? Is it anger? Is it jealousy? Is it bitterness, unforgiveness? Is it one of those type of sins, but it's a demonic power behind it? Is it addiction? Is it pornography? It could be religion. Legalism. Or maybe it is one of these occult type things. Maybe you need to renounce. You know the old prayer? I renounce Satan and all his works. You can say that with me. I renounce Satan and all his works and all his empty promises. Renounce your particular sin. Renounce whatever practice. If you went to a fortune teller, if you went for Reiki, if you did these weird things, whatever you did, if you submitted to a false religion or idolatry or something like that, Renounce it in Jesus. Repent of it and renounce it in Jesus. If your forebears did something, renounce it. And then command that thing to go. If it's witchcraft or occult or divination or sorcery or necromancy or some other witchcraft thing, command it to go. So, Father, I thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power of his cross. And we lift high by faith the cross of Jesus Christ tonight as the only way of forgiveness, as the only source of healing, and as the only way to overcome the devil. And we ask you now that the power of the gospel will forgive sins tonight and set people free, will heal minds, hearts, spirits, and bodies, and that the enemy will be routed and expelled. And I take authority now in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak the healing of Christ over minds, bodies, souls, and spirits. And I command the devil in Jesus' name to flee. Flee from mind. Flee from hearts. Flee from bodies. And we thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you are here and that you are with us and that you are for us. And we are more than conquerors because you love us. And may we be in triumph tonight through Jesus Christ our Lord who gives us the victory this evening. In his wonderful name we pray, amen.